This morning, thanks for that. So this morning we're going to read, um, Pastor Terry is going to come and preach to us. Uh, he's going to preach on Methuselah's father, I believe. And so we're going to be in Genesis 5, to 27, and Deuteronomy 6, 1 to 9. So we're going to start in Genesis 5, to 27. And why don't you stand with me while we read this morning. So Genesis chapter 5, verses 22 to 27. Enoch walked with God after he fathered Methuselah 300 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Enoch were 365 years. Enoch walked with God and he was not, for God took him. When Methuselah had lived 187 years, he fathered Lamech. Methuselah lived after he fathered Lamech 782 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Methuselah were 969 years and he died. Stay with me and stay standing. We're going to read Deuteronomy 6, 1 to 9. So Deuteronomy 6, 1 to 9. Now this is a commandment, the statutes and the rules that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you that you may do them in the land to which you are going over to possess it, that you may fear the Lord your God, you and your son and your son's son, by keeping all his statutes and his commandments, which I command you all the days of your life, and that your days may be long. Hear, therefore, O Israel, and be careful to do them, that they may go well with you, and that you may multiply greatly. As the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you in a land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and you shall be as, as frontlets between your eyes and they shall be, sorry. You shall write them on your doorposts and on your house and on your gates. And that's the reading of our word. We pray the Lord will bless that. Pastor Terry is going to come. Thanks. You may be seated. Father, we, we do pray for Matt and Marcy. We love them dearly. We thank you, Lord, that you have uniquely uh, gifted them both to serve you and minister uh, on your behalf. And Lord, we do pray that if it's your will that uh, things might be worked out, they'd be able to go to Machias and minister there still. But Lord, we pray above all that they just have a certainty in their own hearts about what your will is for them. I know that's their desire. They want to walk in a way that pleases you. They want to be where you want them to be. So make these things very clear. Give them understanding. Give them wisdom as they seek your face, Lord, in these coming weeks. And we pray you make provision for them as a family. Lord, that uh, you'd open up a door uh, for them to minister. And so we entrust them to your loving care. Father, we ask that as we come here this morning, we want to honor fathers. I pray you'd help me to do that as I preach your word. In order to do that, Lord, I need the filling of the Spirit of God, and so I plead for that. And Lord, I want to pray for our fathers. I pray for, for parents in general, but for fathers especially, that God, it would be in their heart to lead their children, to love their children, and to love the Lord their God. Lord, I, I'm afraid in our generation We've tried to recreate our own idea of what the family should be. I pray that you'd lead us in this church, lead the fathers of this church back to having a biblical role as fathers of families. I pray, Father, or to you as our Heavenly Father, that you would help me to give clear instruction to fathers this morning and to, Lord, to heed the command to bring up their children in the discipline and in the, dis the instruction of the things of God. I pray, Father, that you'd be with those, in some cases, single fathers, 
trying to raise their children somewhat on their own, and fractured families. And God, that you'd give strength and protection. Lord, that you'd help them to face whatever trials they're facing, to sense your presence in a special and powerful way. Lord, especially today, may they know your peace. I want to pray this morning, Lord, for dads and moms that have some children that, Lord, are kind of alienated from them right now. They're not desirous to walk with God, and hearts aren't open to the Word. And Lord, we've been praying that you'd reclaim some of these kids and draw their hearts back to yourself and pray that we could see a mighty work in this. We pray that you'd help these parents and, Lord, as much as possible, shield them from the pain. Lord, that they go through as they see their children walking without you. Father, we lift our dads up before you. Lord, we've got dads today that are not stepping up to the plate at all. They've abandoned families, and we pray for their children. God, that you'd bring people into their lives. Help us as a church to be there to strengthen and encourage. We pray for single moms, Lord, that are struggling today because dads aren't being dads in these homes. Father, we pray you'd bring these men that have wandered from you to their knees. We pray you'd bring them to a place of humbling and repentance and of faith in Jesus Christ. Father, I want to I pray this morning for a revival of manhood in our church and in our country. Lord, men have been put down and beaten down until they don't think they can be men and they don't think they can lead. And I pray that we could see a reversal of that. I pray for such a revival to come to your church, Lord, not just here at Devon, but across this city and this province and this country that would turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers, as Malachi tells us. And I pray, God, for revival of the home and the family. Lord, help us to embrace you as the ultimate guide of what it means to be a father. Thank you for being our father, for adopting us into your family and calling us sons and loving us as you do. Thank you for salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now bless us as we come before you in Christ's name. Amen. We'll spend a little time in Genesis and then some other passages of Scripture this morning. This is Father's Day, day we seek to honor fathers. We trust that you'll make at least some effort in your home. Don't pick out their bad points like, you know, it can't cook and stuff like that and can't bake. And I think they're just trying to tell us there isn't anything about cooking he's good at. Uh, sorry about that, Matt. But how many of you know when Father's Day began? not really a biblical holiday or anything like that, but back in 1910, a lady by the name of Sonora Dodd in Spokane, Washington, thought there ought to be a special day where she could honor her father. And so it began there, and surprisingly, 56 years later in 1966, Lyndon B. Johnson signed the proclamation in the United States declaring that the third Sunday in June would be set aside as Father's Day, when we would recognize and honor and pay tribute to our earthly fathers. And you know what was nice to look around the church? I didn't have much time going from my Sunday school class and coming out here to, to look around, but to see fathers that were sitting with their children this morning. That's a, that's a beautiful sight. And to see those children looking up, admiringly at their dads, because they appreciate all that they do in their lives, and to see them here, especially in church together, because God has at least some place in your life, and you're trying to teach your kids that truth. A little uh, girl came up to me a couple of Sundays ago. I think she was one of yours, Matt. She says, preacher, when I get older, uh, I'm going to give you some money. And I said, why would you do that? She says, because my dad says, you're the poorest preacher he ever heard. <laughs> that's why that's his last Sunday.
Another little boy said, was asked by a Sunday school teacher, what's the nicest thing your dad ever did for you? You might think today about what's the nicest thing your dad ever did for you. And that little boy looked up at the Sunday school teacher and said, he married my mother. <laughs> I thought that was a pretty good answer. Dads, fathers. I would doubt very much if you are a father, grandfather, great-grandfather here today, that there's a single one of us that's here that didn't wish that somehow you could be a better father than you are. I know I certainly can say that from, from my perspective and looking at my own life. And that's no slam on you this morning. I want you to know that. It's just a fact of life that we, because we're sinners, we're not really as good at anything as we could have been, right? Because sin abides in us at times and, and uh, wrecks our lives. One of the encouraging things about being a father is that when you read your Bible, you'll find that there is so much, so much that's in there giving guidance, giving instruction to fathers about this is how you do your job. This is how you take care of the role and responsibilities that God has entrusted to you. There's so many things to teach you and to tell you what you need to teach your kids and how to raise your children in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord. There's biblical examples of fathers in the Bible. There's Abraham, who's known as the father of faith. That's a pretty good example for us all to follow, to teach our children that we're men, we're fathers of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. There's David, who is a great king, but really, for the most part, a pretty poor father. Not really an example to follow. His children suffer greatly because of his failure in that area. There's Joseph, the legal father of the Lord Jesus Christ, who seems to be the strong, silent type. He, he doesn't get counted as saying very much in Scripture, but had some influence upon his son because he brought him up in the nurture of the Lord. And uh, then, of course, there's that father that we all know about called the prodigal's father, who's a picture of the father, right? Who son asks for his inheritance and then goes out and wastes it and he's coming back home after he's come to an end of himself and that father sees him and that father what he runs to the son and he hugs his son and the son says now wait a minute dad I'm, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son and I've been down in the pig pen of my life and, and and I'm not worthy just let me be certain dad says dad was having none of that Hugs him to himself and said, you're my son. He says, bring the best robe. Put a ring on his finger. He restored him to his sonship in that home. What a great example of a father of being what? Forgiving to his son. And guess what, dad? Somewhere along the way, you're going to need that ability to take that son, that daughter, and extend forgiveness to them and put loving arms around them in their lives. And then, of course, there's always the example of our heavenly father. Who's a pretty neat father, isn't he? Aren't you glad that he holds you in his hand today? A glorious, great, wonderful father. But I want to draw our attention this morning to, in some ways, maybe an unusual father in the Bible. He's Methuselah's father. Now, after the service, I want everybody to go to a Lynn and ask her to pronounce that word. Sorry, Elin. We've had fun with that this week. Methuselah is famous for one thing. What is it? He's the oldest man that ever lived. 969 years of age. I got thinking about that this week. Can you imagine how many sets of tennis shoes he went through? How many outfits of clothing that he wore out in 969 years? How many trips to McDonald's and Kentucky Fried Chicken? How much chicken would he have eaten in 969 years? But it's not Methuselah I really want to draw your attention to this morning. It's his father. His father's a man by the name of Enoch. And when he was 65 years of age, an event happened in his life that changed everything in his life. 
Because it says here, and I want you to notice carefully, if you, you're looking in, in verse 21, 22, it says, and Enoch did something. He walked with God. When? After he begat Methuselah. The day his son was born. It did something inside him that must have said, I don't know how to do this. I don't know if I'm capable to raise this son, Methuselah. I want to get it right. And it was after that that he made the choice to do what? To begin to walk with God. Can I encourage you, if you don't hear anything else here this morning, Dad... Would you prick up your ears to God and hear him calling you to walk with God? For your sake and for the sake of your sons and your daughters. Walk with God. Parenthood, how many of you would testify, parenthood does change us. I remember my firstborn going to the hospital, watching her be born, seeing the doctor flop her in my arms before they even bothered to clean her off. Thought this was a little yucky, but <laughs> but she's beautiful. And and I just had set my heart, I was going to be the best father the world ever saw. And I was so proud the day that I came back and picked up my wife and my daughter and put them in the car, and the car seat was all there because we we're going to keep her safe and drove her home. And you know, things went pretty good that day, and then we put her in bed that night and Two o'clock in the morning, a little higher pitched. I looked over in the bed and I said, Mary, that's your daughter crying. Go do something about it. <laughs> and thus began my failures as a father. But what a thrilling moment when God gives you the gift of children and they are so precious to us. And I watch children come into this church. And I watch, I watch young moms and dads bring that first child to the church. And it's almost funny to watch because they're so scared and the kid's so fragile and they never dare put that kid in the nursery, right? And then you watch them have the second and the third. And if the fourth one happens to come along, you watch them. Go downstairs and watch some time. They come down with their fourth one, and they say, here, catch. <laughs> you know, they've gotten over the fragile stage with the kids at that point. Having kids changes you in some way. It begins to make you cry out, God, help me to be the father that you intended me to be. You sense the responsibility that's there. I want to... Start by looking at Enoch here to give you just some suggestions that I hope will be helpful and encouraging to you. I, I especially, I said this to Matt the other day, I, I don't want to come to Father's Day and beat you over the head. I don't want you to walk out, well, I got beaten up again. Why would I want to come back for more of that? I want to give you some things that you can really encourage you. Uh, I wish we had time to get even more specific than I'll be able to this morning I've even thought about doing just a, a short series, maybe three or four Sundays, on parenthood and, and how to be a father and mother and, 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 and give you some directions in this way. But this morning, just some, some quick things. Enoch walked with God. I want to say to you dads this morning, be sure you're on the right path. You can be sure you're on your right path if you're walking with God. That's the path to be on. If you're walking away from God, that's not the path to be on. You're not going to be there for your children to be what they need. You're not going to be able to give them what they need. I also want to remind you this. I had somebody, I can't even remember who, so I'm not trying to pick on anybody this morning, who came to me just probably two, three weeks ago. And they said, seeing the world and the way that it is, it's a young person. I don't want to have any kids. Now, there's something wrong with that, and I'll tell you what it is. You're being disobedient to what God said. He said, go into the world and what? Be fruitful and multiply. He's not taking that back. So I think we ought to have kids. 
And they say, but I don't want to have kids because this is such a terrible day. How many of you can relate to that? There's fears about that. But what you need to understand is the day when Enoch was called upon to be a father wasn't a good day either. Those were the days of Noah. Those were the days when the imaginations of men's hearts and minds was only evil continually. It sounds a little bit like today, doesn't it? You just pick up the newspaper and, and it's everywhere it's in our newspapers today. Well, I want to remind you, God, God called upon Enoch to be a father in that kind of a day. And he not only had Methuselah, but it says he went on and he had sons and daughters. And I don't know how many more, but he was around for another 300 years, so he probably had several. Could have had several hundred for all I know. But he had several more children after that. But it says that when that child was born, he began. You know what that tells me? There needs to be a beginning point. If you're going to walk with God, it's got to start somewhere. You, you have to make a decision. It tells me that at that point, Enoch opened up his heart to God. I think if put it in today's terms, he acknowledged, Lord, I'm a sinner and I can't do this. And I need your help. And Lord, I need your forgiveness. I need your cleansing. We would say today, and so I trust Jesus Christ as my Savior to take away my sin, to cleanse my soul, to send his spirit to live within me, to empower me to be a what? Well, for one thing, to be a father, to give spiritual leadership and direction to my home. He opened up his heart to the Lord and received the Lord into his life. I can read that much into that and not do any damage to this passage of Scripture. How many times has a little kid been used to speak to a, a mom or a dad about their need for Christ? There's a guy I was reading about this week named Willie Lee. Willie Lee lived down in Georgia and was not a godly man. And one afternoon he was working in his backyard and as he was walking, for some reason he happened to look behind him and there's this little boy coming. And he was, this Willie Lee was a tall man and there's this little boy and he was coming and his little boy was trying to stretch himself to get into his daddy's footprints. And he said, at that moment, God spoke to Willie Lee's heart and said, where are you leading your son? Where will he end up if he continues to follow in your footsteps? And Willie Lee went down to a little Baptist church and heard the gospel, talked to the preacher after the service, and opened up his heart to Jesus Christ as his personal Savior. A little child shall what? Shall lead them. That's what the scripture says. And he was, he was leading this man in his life because he needed God in his life. I remember years ago, 30 some years ago, pastoring in Cross Creek, New Brunswick. And a man showing up at our house, I think it was a Saturday night. He said, where have you been? And I had been to Fredericton and just gotten home. And this is about nine o'clock at night. He said, I've been driving around scared to death that I was going to die before I got to talk to you. He says, I need to be saved. And I remember we went up in our bedroom because a lot of commotion in the house. And we went up in my bedroom. He sat on the bed and I sat on the bed. And I just opened up the scriptures and showed him how to trust Christ as his personal savior. And then we both got down, down beside the bed and Sonny Foreman prayed to receive Christ as savior. And we got up off our knees, and we looked over, and his little boy was standing in the doorway. He was about 10, 11 years of age at the time. And I said, uh, do you want something, Vance? He said, yeah, I'd like to do what Dad did. And so I got to take and sit on the bed with his son. And went through the gospel with his son and explained it to him and tried to make sure that he understood what I was talking about. And he seemed to. And he got down on his knees and trusted Christ as his Savior that night beside our bed. See, dads, a little child can lead us, but you ought to be leading your child. You ought to be leading your child to put their faith, hope, and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to talk to you this morning about making God the center of your life. I fight this. My children are pretty much grown up, but I still fight this. We, 
we make other things the center of our lives. I know some men, and my wife would tell you that, that too often I make my work the center of my life. And that's not right. I'm fighting it. Pray for me to get it right. And I'm serious about that. But if you're making work the center of your life, it means that somebody else that ought to be the center of your life isn't. Some of you, man, it's, it's all about sports. <laughs> I hear you. You talk in the foyer. If I run by you, you're downstairs talking, waiting to get your kids out of nursery or whatever. Sports, sports, sports. Now, listen, nothing wrong with sports. I, I like sports. I like to play sports. I can't do the backflips like <laughs> Daniel. I bet Pastor Moore would have done a backflip if he'd seen him do that. <laughs> Sports is a good thing, but it's not supposed to be the center of your life. Work's a good thing, but it's not the center of our lives. Paul figured that out. He said, for me to live. How do you finish that? How do you finish it? For me to live is Christ. That sentence was never meant to be finished. For me to live is work. It was never meant to be finished. For me to live is sports. It was meant to be finished. For me to live is Christ. Now, by the way, if, if my focus is Christ, he's also told me that I'm to love my wife as Christ loved his church. So my wife becomes a necessary focus. If my focus is on Jesus, it's going to be more on my wife than it would have been. And if, if I'm a father, then he's told me my focus is to raise my children in the discipline, the nurture, and the admonition, the instruction of the Lord. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4. So getting your focus right, your priorities right in your life can make all the difference in the world of how you're going to live. Paul says, not speaking of physical children that he'd given birth to, but speaking of sons in the faith, he says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are doing what? They're walking in the truth. Nothing will give you greater joy, not in life and not at the gate of eternity where you step into eternity, than knowing this, that your children are walking in in the truth, the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, following the Lord, loving the Lord with all their heart, all their mind, all their soul, all their strength. Now, Christ is our priority, but if Christ is our priority, think about what priorities need to line up underneath that. One of the priorities that you have, if you're a parent this morning, you're a mom or a dad, let me tell you what your priority is. Your priority is to gradually transfer the dependence that your children have placed upon you. They're kind of dependent, right? They come out of the womb, and you just got to do everything for them. And that seems to go on for about 18 years, doesn't it? <laughs> Sometimes it goes on for longer than that. But, I mean, it lessens their dependence, or it should lessen their dependence upon you. And to transfer their dependence, listen, not on themselves but to transfer that dependence upon the Lord God. You've done your job as a parent. When you've taught your children to transfer their dependence that they've had on you for most of their life and transfer it over onto the living God as they walk out of your home to embrace their own life. That's your job, priority. And I want us to go over to Deuteronomy here for a moment. Deuteronomy in chapter 6. And let me just give you the context of Deuteronomy chapter 6. It's, it's written in the context of the Ten Commandments. If you go back into chapter 5, he's just declared to them, these are the Ten Commandments, the Decalogue that he got up on the mountaintop, and, and he's given this to them. And he says this, now this is a commandment, and these are the statutes, judgments, which the Lord your God has commanded to teach you that you may observe them in the land that you're, you're going to cross over to, uh, to possess that you may fear the Lord your God, to keep his statutes, his commandments, which I command. I command who? Commandments are for who? Say it. You're going to be here a long time if you don't start to, to give me answers. You. They're for you. First of all, you've got to embrace them. You've got to say, 
these are the commandments, the laws of God, and I want to follow them. And, and, but not just to you. And to who? Say it louder. Fans are noisy. Your children, your sons, your daughters. And it doesn't stop there. And to who? Your grandchildren. The next generation. I don't know if you've ever stopped to think about it, but you have in your hands, entrusted to you by God, the power to change your generation and the next generation for God. That's your responsibility given to you as a parent. One family at a time, one home at a time, one church at a time, being transformed by getting your eyes on the living God. Moses says, God's directed me to teach you so you can teach your sons, so they can teach their sons, your grandsons, and on and on from generation to generation to generation. Question, if my job is to transfer dependence of my children from me to God, how do I do that? How do I do that? You want to know? Well, he tells us here. He, he, he just goes on and, and, and says, look at verse 4. Hear, O Israel. It's like he shouts this. I won't do it because this speaker system might pick me up and bust your eardrums. But just picture this being shouted. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God. The Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. How do we transfer dependence from us to God? Every Jewish home would have repeated this statement every morning. Would have recited it with their children. Shema Yisrael Yehovah Elohanu Ikad. <laughs> I have no idea if I pronounced that right. What, it, what does it mean? It means, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You've got to start to teach your kids if you're going to transfer the dependence that there is a God. And there's only one God. You don't have to worry about this God and a little bit of your attention and this God and a little bit of your attention and this one. No, there's only one God, the living God, the Lord God. And the Bible says, I want you to help me out here. What are you supposed to do with that God? You're supposed to love that God. Love God. How much? With all your heart. That's your instruction mat, to love God and love him with all your heart as a father. Can I tell you, even though I've been a pastor going on 40 years, Probably the fear of my life was I didn't love God with all my heart, soul, and mind. I love God. And I love God today, but I'd have to tell you, I, I'm still not sure if I love him with all my heart, soul, and mind. Is that honest enough? I surely want to. I pray about it every day. How many of you would say, I'm not sure I love God with all my heart, mind, soul, and strength? And that's scary. Because listen to me, Dad, especially if you've got kids in your home today. The most dangerous thing in the world you can do for your sons and your daughters is just to love God a little bit. You know what flu shots are? I, I, I don't get them, but a lot of people tell me they do. I, I don't get them because I was told they kill brain cells and I can't spare any. Well, what do they do when they give you a flu shot? What do they give you? They give you a little bit of the flu. And what does that little bit of the flu do? It makes you immune to all the rest of the flu. So you supposedly don't get the flu. And the danger 
dad and mom of your children knowing that you only love God a little bit is that you may indeed make them immune to all of him. When they see that God isn't number one in your life, that you don't love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and you're sold out to God, and you passionately follow Him with every fervor of your being, you raise the risk of turning your heart's child against God and making him immune to eternal God. And it's hard. There's so many things in our world to distract us from loving God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. We get distracted by doing things we think are good. I, I want to provide for my kids. I don't know how many people I've had say over the past 40 years, I want my kids to have blank, what? More than I have. And you work your life trying to give your kids this and give your kids that and make sure they get this experience and that experience and the other thing. And we run ourselves ragged to get them to a ballet class and then over to soccer practice and then to something else. I want to tell you the danger that you face in our generation. Instead of being a God-focused family, you become a child-focused family. And you will fail every time when you become child-focused in your home. God never intended your home to be child-focused. Did you know that? How many of you didn't know that? You're to be God-focused. Priority number one is God, my relationship with Him. Love God. Be passionate about God. Seek to serve this God. The greatest need your kids have is not that they can have everything that you can give them. Greatest thing that you can give them is God, but give them of yourself. A self who walks with God, like Enoch walked with God. I had this great thought this week. I'm such a profound thinker. I'm not. But I thought about this. You know what? Methuselah never knew a day when his dad did not walk with God. He began when he was 65 years of age, and for the next 300 years, he walked with God every single day. Dad, would you make that your goal? Just to walk with God, to make him your focus, your priority, the greatest relationship in your life. We get caught up in getting our kids to all these things and running them here and there. We want to make sure they get the greatest education in the world. We get them so educated that I went to a man this week, nice guy, one of the nicest guys I've ever met. Gave me the best news that I've gotten in a long time. I don't know how many of you know, but three weeks ago I went to my doctor. She says, I'm pretty certain that that's cancer. So I went and had a biopsy. And, you know, the Lord's so good. She said, I won't even be able to get you into a doctor for over a month probably. I get in within about a week and a half. And then the biopsy came back in just a week. And so on Friday morning, I went up to the hospital, a little bit of fear and trembling. And he looks at me, he says, you can breathe easy. It's not cancer. That was such good news. And I began to talk to him. And his father was a retired Pentecostal preacher. And I began to try and talk to him about the Lord. And he has no interest whatsoever and the things of God. And there's a dad focused on his son, got him the best education he could get him. He's a doctor today, but without Christ. Pray, pray for that man. I won't give you his name, but pray for him that God would open up the understanding of his heart to see his sin and to see that the Lord is God and he needs to be related to him rightly. And he can only be that through the power of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. The best thing you can do for your kid is to what? Love God. Be a passionate Christ follower, a fully devoted follower of the Lord. I met a man several months ago, <clears throat> used to go here regularly. 
And I said to him, hey, I haven't seen you for a while. No, no. Well, I've been busy. I said, well, how long has it been since you've been out to church? Oh, about six months. I said, what have you been busy at? Oh, just taking my kids here. We're, we're so busy. We go here on Sunday, and they play this sport on Sunday, and they do this on Sunday, and they do that on Sunday. And uh, Let me get this right. You're so busy that you don't have time to meet with God. I want to tell you, parents, I'm not apologizing for it. You're sending a powerful message to your children that God isn't important. You may say differently, it doesn't matter. Your life is speaking larger than your lips. Your kids need to be here on a Sunday morning. They need to be under the sound of the Word of God. Not my voice, but under the sound of the Word of God. Worshiping God together with the people of God. When I say a follower of Jesus Christ, I might as well take this one more step. I'm already in trouble. I don't mean somebody that comes and just sits in a pew on Sunday. Your children need to see you fully engaged and involved in God's church. That means not just sitting in a pew and maybe dropping something in the offering plate. Heard when the offering was being taken up last Sunday, as a little boy leaned over us to his dad and said, Dad, you don't need to pay for me. I'm under five. We're talking about an involvement because God has given you, every Christian has a spiritual gift that you need to be exercising within the body, meeting needs in other people's lives, reflecting Christ to a lost world, and we need to be doing that. Christianity isn't a spectator sport. You need to get on the field and play. You need to be involved in serving the Lord, contributing to the family, immersed in building biblical relationships with other Christians within the church family. I wish I had time to say more about that. But it's desperately needed in the church today. I was reading this survey. It said if both mom and dad go to church regularly and participate, not just attend, but they participate, 72% of their kids as adults will not only go to church, but they'll be actively participating in the church. 72%. Now, that's not as good as I'd like it to be, but it's good. If only the mom went to church and was involved, that percentage drops to 15%, from 72 to 15. If only the dad goes to church, and frankly, that's rarely, but I've seen it. If only the dad goes to church, the percentage goes from 15 all the way back up to 55%. If he's involved, if he's engaged, he's serving in the church, he's a deacon, he's this, he's that, within the church, a Sunday school teacher and so on, the percentages of those kids going on to walk with God goes up significantly. But for children whose mom and dad don't follow the Lord and don't know the Lord, you know it drops clean down to 6%. Only 6% if you're not fully engaged follower of Jesus Christ, that they're going to follow the morals, and so on, and, and come to know Christ as their Savior and have heaven as their home one day. So I say to you parents this morning, do you love God? Do you love Him with all your heart? Do you love Him with all your soul? Do you love Him with all your strength? What would I say if I'd followed you the last week? If I had been in your home, if I just walked in and saw the magazines that are in your magazine rack or on your coffee table or beside the toilet. That's where you do your reading. I don't know. What would I learn about you? What, what if I could go into your computer and check out your history and the things that you've been watching on there, Dad? What, what would that tell me about how much you love God? If, if I could check out your finances, I know you don't have checkbooks anymore, that's a thing of the past, but if I could check out your finances and see where you spent your money, would I know from that that God's a priority in your life? Would you know it? Would I know that you contributed money towards the air conditioning? Just a little plug. Number one, if you want to be a dad, is love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. You know what number two is? Lead your families. 
Love God, lead your family. You're supposed to be a leader, a spiritual leader in your home. Lead our families. I can only throw these words out because my time's gone. But lead your families spiritually. Lead your family spiritually. Can I tell you this? Learn to lead your family intentionally. It doesn't just happen by chance. Lead them intentionally. If you want your kids, my dad wanted me to be a reader. Thought that was one of the greatest things. And so he would put a newspaper in front of me and say, hey, read this article for me. So I'd read it for him. And he'd do that night after night just to get me to read. And I fell in love with reading. Guess what? I read a little bit. He taught me the love of reading. He did it intentionally. If you want your kids to walk with God, then do some things intentionally in their lives to teach them to walk with God. Listen, one of the things we've got to get a hold of is to learn to lead our families counterculturally, not following the culture, not what everybody else is doing, but what does God want us to do in leading our kids in that way, not just because everybody else is doing it. If we're going to do that, we've got to learn to value our family time and use it in a valuable way with our kids. What, what the experts are saying, and I think they got it right, that if there is a strong identity with the family, the peer pressure is a lot less. But where there's not a strong identity with the family, a strong bond between fathers and mothers and their children, the peer pressure is monumental in their life. Who do you want influencing your kids? The peers that are out there today or mom and dad? Then you've got to build intentional relationships. You've got to lead them counterculturally in this day so they're not giving in to all the weird and wonderful things that are being tossed at them. We need to lead relationally, building relationships with our kids so they know we love them and we care about them. Not so we become child-centered, but God-centered. We take time. Take your daughters on dates and take some time to talk with them about God. Yes, have them a fun time. Take them to an expensive meal somewhere. But, but listen, talk to them about God and the relationship with Him so they know that you're a God-centered parent. Learn to set some standards in your home. Well, Mom, I... Every other teenager gets to stay out until 1 o'clock. I don't care. There's a different standard in our home. It's not going to fly here. It's not the way it's going to be. You come home after 12, the door's going to be locked. If you knock and wake me up, good luck at that. I might get up and let you in, but you're going to have to do that. I, I like, was a single mom. Told us a true story. I don't know this for fact. But her teenage boy came home, and he was really just all week long riding her. I want to go to this movie. Yeah, Mom, I know it's an R-rated movie, but it's really not that much in there. I don't know how you know that if you haven't seen it. But this, it's not that bad, Mom. I want to go with my friends. All the guys are going. And finally she says, uh, you know what? She knew his favorite dessert was brownies. So she says, I'll tell you what, if you help me make some brownies, I'll let you go to the R-rated movie with your buddies. So she begins to get out the ingredients, and I don't know what goes into brownies. I know he doesn't. <laughs> Chocolate, and I don't know what else you probably put in there, right? Cocoa, something. And she's getting it all mixed up, and she handed her son a spoon and she says, okay, I want you to go out in the yard and get a scoop up some dog poo. What? Yeah, we're going to make these brownies, but we need a little bit of dog poo. So, no, no, yeah. If you want to go to the movie, you got to go scoop up some doggy poo. So he takes the spoon and he goes out in the yard and he comes in and he's got this scoop of doggy poo. And he says, oh, no, 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 that's too much. We'll cut it in half. So it's just a little bit. And then she dropped it into the brownie mix and stirs it all up and says, okay, let's eat it. And you can guess his reaction to that. No, mom, that's bad. You can't expect us to eat that. She said, but there's just a little bit of bad in it. 
And that kid got it, what? There may be just a little bit of bad in the movie, but it's more bad than I want to be put in your heart and in your mind. Stand counterculturally to everything that's being spewed out of the cesspool of iniquity in our world, in our day. You need to understand that God's more important more concerned about the holiness of your kids than he is the happiness of your kids. And especially happiness that comes on a temporal basis. And let me tell you this, all those things that you're running them to, gymnastics, ballet, this and that, and I'm not against you doing some of those things with your kids. Don't get me wrong here. But if that's all you're doing, you don't have time for church, right? If that becomes your priority and God's not your priority, all those things pass away. You think we ought to be spending all our time on things that are passing away instead of the things that are eternal and lasting for eternity? I want to encourage you today. Dad, listen, love God with all your heart. Learn to lead your family. Get into this book, and there's so much truth here. Learn to teach your children how to handle their money in God's, God's way. Learn to teach your children about how to select the right kind of friends. There's all kinds of things in Proverbs that will teach you about that. Learn to teach your children to watch the words that they use that come out of their mouth and the way that they speak them. Learn to teach your children to be responsible. Learn to teach your children to guard their minds and what they put into their minds and their hearts. Teach your children to reject it when they hear a bad joke. Don't you laugh at it and teach them that it's okay to laugh at bad jokes. You're teaching them something you don't want to teach them. Guard your minds. Guard your heart. Teach your children to be generous. How many of you think we need to teach kids that? We've taught them to be real selfish. We've taught them the world revolves around them. We've taught them they ought to get everything that they want. But are we teaching our kids to be generous? Something we need to purposely, intentionally teach our kids. And above all, above all, teach your kids to fear God. And to love God with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength. So I'm done. What are you going to do? Well, I'm going home, having a barbecue. Going to eat. What are you going to do with what God's fed you today? What are you going to do with what you've heard? You're going to do something about loving God with more of your heart, more of your mind, and more of your soul, and more of your strength to commit yourself to God. I want to tell you the most important thing you can do as a dad is to lead your kids to God. And if you're walking with God, I'll guarantee you, your children follow your footsteps. If you're walking with God, you'll find out your kids will tend to walk with God. I'm not giving guarantees. I'm saying they tend to walk with God if you walk with God. Teach your kids to love the one that gave his life for them and loved them supremely. Gave himself on the cross. Are you going to lead your kids spiritually, intentionally, purposely? Teach them about money and friends and all the things I just listed for you. Are we going to do anything about that? How many of you say, I make it my prayer today that God would help me to love him more. And he'd help me to lead my kids intentionally, purposely for God. Make that decision in your heart. I'm not going to ask you to walk an aisle this morning. But you need to make some intentional decisions before God. How many of you would say this morning, you know what? God hasn't had much in my heart, not much in my life. I've not loved God with all my heart. I've loved this and that and other things first, but I want to get it right with God. I want to change. I want to yield to God. I don't think God's ever going to be satisfied with second place, third place, fifth place, tenth place. Where does he want? He wants first place in your heart and in your life. Does he even have any place? Do you know him? Do you know him as your personal Lord and Savior? Have you trusted Christ as your Savior today? Is he dominating your life? You see, he's Lord. He demands it all. We're his servants. We're to commit ourselves to him. Methuselah never knew a day when his dad didn't walk with God. Wouldn't it be great if from this Sunday morning your children never knew a day when their dad wasn't walking with God, serving God, actively involved in giving his life to Christ and influencing them for the Savior and for eternity. Wouldn't that be great? Let's pray that for one another.